Top 10 Misconceptions About Famous Crimes and Trials From sensationalized headlines to dramatic retellings, the world of crime often gets distorted in the public eye. Today, we're diving into the top 10 misconceptions about famous crimes and trials, separating fact from fiction. Buckle up, because the truth can be more surprising than you think. Number 1. Charles Manson was not a serial killer. Contrary to popular belief, Charles Manson isn't accurately categorized as a serial killer. Though he's often the first name associated with the term, Manson himself never directly took a life. The heinous acts he's remembered for were actually committed by his followers, known as the Manson family, over a span of two nights in August 1969. The definition set by the FBI for a serial killer involves the unlawful killing of two or more victims by the same offenders in separate events, with an emotional cooling-off period between the murders. Manson's followers, fueled by his visions of an impending race war and inspired by the Beatles' song Helter Skelter, were driven to commit their crimes without the characteristic cooling-off period. Instead of blending back into society, they isolated themselves in a commune, playing Beatles records and indulging in Manson's apocalyptic rhetoric. Given these details, Manson's involvement falls more in line with mission killing rather than serial killing. Legally, he faced charges for seven counts of first-degree murder by proxy, thus labeling him a proxy murderer rather than a serial killer. Number 2. The mystery behind the name D.B. Cooper. The 1971 hijacking orchestrated by the man known as D.B. Cooper remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in American history. But here's a surprising twist, D.B. Cooper never called himself that. He purchased his ticket as Dan Cooper. The D.B. misconception began with James Long, a reporter from the Oregon Journal and Dwayne Youngbar of Northwest Orient Airlines. Amidst stormy weather and a poor phone connection, Youngbar's pronunciation of Dan was misunderstood as D&B by Long. This mistake was propagated and the name D.B. Cooper took root in the public imagination. The accuracy of the surname Cooper was later put to the test when Marla Cooper, in 2011, claimed her uncle, Lynn Doyle, L.D., Cooper, was the infamous hijacker. She recounted a telling memory from Thanksgiving 1971 when her uncle appeared injured and hinted at a big secret. His military and logging background matched the FBI's profile of D.B. Cooper. And while DNA from the crime scene didn't match Lynn Doyle Cooper's, he hasn't been conclusively ruled out as the suspect. Number 3. The Myth of Lizzie Borden's Guilt The notorious 1893 double murder of Abby and Andrew Borden still captures imaginations, thanks largely to a popular children's rhyme that gruesomely recounts the event. The rhyme goes, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. And when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. However, this catchy verse distorts the truth. Firstly, the weapon used was a hatchet, not an axe. Secondly, the number of blows dealt to each victim is misrepresented. Lizzie's father was struck 11 times and her stepmother between 18 to 19 times. But most importantly, the rhyme wrongly accuses Lizzie of the crime. In reality, after a brief deliberation, she was acquitted. Further casting doubt on her guilt, another axe murder occurred nearby while Lizzie was in detention. Additionally, Lizzie was found without any blood on her shortly after the second killing, suggesting she wasn't the perpetrator. Number 4. John Wayne Gacy was not a killer clown. The legacy of John Wayne Gacy has cast a long, disturbing shadow over the world of clowns. Dubbed the killer clown, Gacy's infamous reputation has, unfortunately, been intertwined with this joyful children's entertainer figure. Yet, it's crucial to clear up a widespread misconception, Gacy never committed his heinous crimes while dressed as his clown persona, Pogo the Clown. Gacy's performances as Pogo were mostly restricted to innocent venues like children's hospitals and church events, bringing laughter and joy. His sinister activities, which included the murder and assault of over 30 young boys, were carried out separately from his clowning engagements. The haunting association of Gacy with clowning didn't emerge from his actual crimes but rather the events and actions after his arrest. Just a day before being captured, Gacy chillingly remarked to a police officer, clowns can get away with murder. This unsettling comment, 
combined with the eerie clown paintings he created while on death row, further solidified his terrifying connection to the clown world. These paintings, some fetching more than $20,000, stand out due to one alarming detail, instead of the comforting rounded smiles usually painted on clowns, Gacy's clowns bore sinister, pointy smiles, leaving an indelible mark on his chilling legacy. Number 5. Jesse James was not the Robin Hood of the West. Contrary to songs by Bruce Springsteen, Pete Seeger, and Warren Zevin, Jesse James wasn't a working-class hero, fighting against oppressive banks or donating to the needy. In reality, James was a self-centered thief, spending his ill-gotten gains on women, alcohol, and horses. He didn't discriminate, robbing the poor as willingly as any other target. Jesse James himself cultivated this heroic myth. During his criminal activities, he propagated self-styled narratives through press releases and letters, framing himself as a champion. Editor John Newman Edwards amplified this, presenting James as a passionate ex-rebel battling Missouri's reconstruction laws, suggesting that robbing government banks was a continuation of the Confederacy's mission. However, this association with the Confederacy is deeply ironic. Following the Centralia massacre, where James gang killed and mutilated unarmed Union soldiers, the Confederacy labeled him a war criminal. Cast out of the military, James turned to bank robbing, driven not by a noble cause, but by personal greed. Number 6. The McDonald's coffee case was far from frivolous. Stella Liebeck, often known as the McDonald's coffee lady, is frequently cited as an example of frivolous lawsuits. However, her story is more profound than popular perception suggests. Contrary to the notion that she merely spilled coffee for a payout, the real issue was with McDonald's serving their coffee at dangerous temperatures, approximately 88 degrees Celsius, 190 degrees Fahrenheit. This strategy was to amplify the aroma, enticing more customers. Before Liebeck's incident in 1993, over 700 people had been burned by the scalding coffee. Stella, at 79, spilled the coffee in a stationary car, resulting in third-degree burns requiring skin grafts, with medical bills amounting to $10,000. She initially requested McDonald's to cover part of these costs. In response, they offered only $800. The jury, recognizing McDonald's negligence, fined the company $2.7 million, though it was later reduced to $640,000. Following this, McDonald's adjusted the serving temperature of their coffee. Number 7. Elliot Ness did not bring down Al Capone. Elliot Ness, often depicted in films and TV shows, is famously believed to have been the force behind Al Capone's downfall. While Ness did lead raids disrupting Capone's bootlegging activities, this was merely a dent in the vast empire of the gangster, who profited more from gambling and prostitution. The real game-changer in the Capone saga was U.S. Judge James Wilkerson. When prosecutors, uncertain about their tax evasion case strength, proposed a lenient 2.5-year plea deal for Capone, it was Wilkerson who stepped in. Determined to ensure justice, he switched out the jury to avoid Capone's influence and then rejected the plea bargain. The result was Capone being sentenced to an unheard of 11 years for tax evasion, effectively ending his reign of crime. While Ness's efforts are lauded in entertainment, it's pivotal to recognize Wilkerson's instrumental role in this chapter of crime history. Number 8. The Scopes Trial was a get-rich-quick scheme. The Scopes Monkey Trial, frequently depicted as a pivotal clash between science and religion in American history, wasn't genuinely rooted in high-minded ideals as many believe. Instead, its origins were steeped in a desire for publicity and economic opportunity for Dayton, Tennessee. This desire was seen by local businessman George Replaya when he learned of the ACLU's offer to financially back anyone who would challenge the Butler Act, a law that prohibited the teaching of evolution in Tennessee schools. Rather than the off-portrayed hero of academic freedom, John Scopes was not even a regular biology teacher. His usual subjects were math, physics, and he also coached football. He only touched upon a textbook that referenced evolution when he was covering for an ill biology teacher. Adding to the theatrical nature of the trial, Scopes' defense team even instructed students to testify falsely that he had taught evolution. Far from being a pure-hearted defense of intellectual freedom, 
The trial was primarily a well-orchestrated publicity stunt aimed at benefiting Dayton. Number 9. The trial of Dan White never claimed the Twinkie defense. In 1978, the city of San Francisco was shaken by the murders of Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk. The man behind the crime was none other than Dan White, a former colleague and member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. The subsequent trial led to a significant uproar, largely because of what became known as the Twinkie defense. Many believed White's defense team argued that his excessive consumption of Twinkies and other junk food caused a sugar-induced frenzy that led him to commit the murders. However, this interpretation is a misrepresentation of the actual defense. While Twinkies were indeed mentioned in the trial, they weren't posited as the direct cause of White's actions. Instead, the defense painted a picture of White as someone who once had been a disciplined athlete, maintaining a healthy lifestyle. But following personal and professional challenges, including the loss of his job, he spiraled into deep depression, evidenced in part by his newfound consumption of junk food like Twinkies. This significant change in behavior and diet was used to emphasize his deteriorating mental health, suggesting he wasn't in a state of mind to commit premeditated murder. Over time, the narrative shifted in public discourse, with the Twinkie detail becoming the most sensationalized and remembered aspect of the trial. Number 10. Kitty Genovese did not die surrounded by 38 strangers. In 1964, the murder of Kitty Genovese became a symbol of urban apathy due to reports that 38 onlookers did nothing as she was attacked. This narrative sparked widespread discussions about the bystander effect. However, the reality is more nuanced. In actuality, there were only about five or six confirmed witnesses, and of these, nearly two saw the attack unfold. Furthermore, it's a misconception that everyone remained passive. One individual did shout at the attacker, causing him to temporarily flee. Another, while reluctant to personally confront the situation because he was inebriated, did get a neighbor's help to alert the police. The established narrative of the incident oversimplifies the complexity of the actual events that night.